Hello and welcome to this Open House Dublin tour of the architectural highlights of EPIC, the Irish Emigration Museum. I'm here with my colleague Susan. Susan, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Dara. And we're going to be talking about the museum that is under this building on Custom House Quay. To give you an idea of what EPIC, the Irish Emigration Museum is, let's watch a very short video. Over the centuries, some 10 million people left the island of Ireland. Now you can travel in their footsteps and discover how this small island made such a big impression on the world. Experience over 300 remarkable tales of adventure, sacrifice and triumph. Follow their hopes and dreams. Celebrate their victories. See life through their eyes. Uncover rogues and wretches and their notorious legacies. Sing the songs they took with them and dance to their tune. Be inspired by their creativity. Hear their captivating stories. Explore new worlds and meet some unforgettable characters. Journey through 1500 years of Irish history, brought to life like never before at the world's first fully digital museum, EPIC, the Irish Emigration Museum. Susan, many people may be familiar with the CHQ building as it is now, a mix of co-working, retail and eateries down near the customs house. But what was the building before? This building was known as Stack A yeah. originally. It was a bonded warehouse and it stored tea, tobacco, whiskey and wine. The boats would come all the way up the River Liffey to this point and would offload their cargo. And the customs on these goods would have been paid over at a building across the road there called the Harbour Master. When was the building built and who by? It was built by John Rennie, Scotsman, famous, most famous civil engineer of the time. It was built 200 years ago, so happy birthday to the CHQ building. Now, a lot of our visitors come in and say, what was this building? They love, when they come in, they love it. What was it used for? Was this a train station? Mm -hmm. So people think, oh, it looks like Houston Station, but Houston Station came 20 years later. We have an image here from the early 2000s when the renovations on this building started, but this is very reminiscent of this image. What are we seeing here? So this goes back to 1856, and we're seeing a party or a banquet. The banquet was to celebrate and honour roughly 3,000 soldiers who had come home from fighting in the Crimean War. They were fighting uh, in, for the British Army. So this um, scene that you can see flags on the walls there, and the columns were painted red, white, and blue to represent the British Army. So we had roughly 4,000 people attend this event, and it was one of the big society events of that time. It was held here because this was the single largest interior space that could hold such a number of people. Actually, the ground space of this building is roughly the size of Coke Park. Our front window is absolutely beautiful. It is the largest window in Ireland. It throws magnificent light through the building. I've been working here since uh, May 2006, four years now, and it's still a pleasure to walk through these doors. Early summer mornings, the building is flooded with light, and with the onset of autumn, a gentle sunshine shines through the building. The natural light changes the mood, so to speak. Christmas time comes around and it's beautiful, beautifully de de decorated with the trees and lights. It looks beautiful no matter the season, indeed, and you could write poetry about it. On the day of opening the museum in May 2016, there was an air of great excitement. The founder, Mr. Neville Dell, and Mary Robinson opened it officially, and Mary switched on the light, which is positioned directly over the entrance stairs to the museum. This light is symbolic of the times when Mary was president and she had a candle lit in the window of the Oris on Outron. This candle represented our Irish immigrants abroad, and it was a reminder that they were not forgotten and would always be welcomed home. Hence the copper colored candle shaped light at Epic, which is never turned off and can be seen glowing in the window after dark. It's a beautiful and a special touch. And speaking of the Irish abroad, we are one of the only museums that you need a passport to enter. The, pa the passport is, in fact, a map. We have 20 galleries downstairs. And we, we use four themes to tell the story about the, about the museum. Um, themes are migration itself, motivational factors, why people left, the influence of the Irish abroad, and the celebrations of the Irish abroad. Tell me about the Angel's Share. I love this story. So this 
Is it the brickwork in of the vaults above your head when you're walking downstairs? There was a lot of alcohol stored downstairs in the vaults, four and a half thousand pints of wine, and a lot of whiskey barrels, equaling two million liters of alcohol. So the guardian angel of pipes and barrels had a lot to take care of and certainly received her share. The angel share was a reference to the evaporation of alcohol, which emanated from porous oak barrels. And you can see the evidence of that in the ceilings here and the difference in the color denoting the effect of the vaporized alcohol. So let's have a look at the vaults. The entire uh, basement level is made up of a series of barrel shaped vaults. And these vaults are being reworked and repurposed to accommodate the birth of Epic. And because this is a listed building, the architects have to be very careful how the work was carried out. The conversion of the vaults was carried out by Darmody Architects with the help from the conservation architect, Tom Breen. In each gallery, you will see circular features in the ceiling. These were originally used as light wells containing thick glass lenses set on iron plates in, from the floor above. So basically the ground floor was uh, uh, pulling down shafts of light to the vaults below. So these have now been repurposed for use of ventilation systems and cables and exhibit mounts have also been integrated as you can see in this photo. All of these additions and all of the installations can be removed from the vaults without damaging the structure. The architects really have made a stunning use of this space. You walk into the vaults and there's something that you don't expect. So what is this that we're seeing? This is in our first gallery called An Open Island, and these are columns. It's like a corridor, as you can see there, and it, this uh, portrays the beautiful Irish landscape, such as the mountains of Kerry, the Giant's Causeway, and so on. And this stunning ship and vessel sculpture. Please tell me about this. This is amazing. This almost takes up the entire space of that vault. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard many excla exclamations of, wow, look at this, this is beautiful. But this was designed by a lady named Ellie McManus, mm -hmm. and uh, the company All Shapes All Makes uh, assembled it, and they're based in Wicklow. And they it tells basically how the Irish moved abroad. That's right. We talk about the ships from the earliest, the sixth century, featuring the Kirk, when uh, monks and so on used to go over to Iona. Then we talk about the Viking ships all the way up to the present day. There's three aircraft also cleverly suspended um, over the ships themselves. Talk about the um, super, the Lockheed Super Super Constellation. That was the first aircraft with the old propeller engines that traveled from Ireland with passengers on board over to the USA. We also featured the Jeannie Johnson. You may know about the Jeannie Johnson. She mm -hmm. was known as a coffin ship, but in fact, the Jeannie was the only ship. Well, she was known as a coffin ship, but nobody ever died on board due to the fact that the owners and the captain, James Atchard. Uh, insisted upon having a doctor on board at all times. In fact, it was also a uh, cause for celebration because there was a baby born on the first flight. So it's one of the only famine ships that actually grew its number. That's right. <laughs> and it's still outside on the river at the moment. So every vault that you walk into tells a different story, as people can see on screen at the moment. We make a lot of touchscreen technology. So you're actually touching with styluses. Yeah, at, rather at the, than looking at artifacts. Absolutely. You're touching the screens with styluses. You are interacting as you go through the gallery yourself. You can stop and pause and read if you like, but you can also choose when you want to stop where you're reading and then approach touch screens and spend as much time as you want there. It's important to know that we have a lot of content, a lot of history, a lot of content down there. So you can go uh, as slowly or as quickly as move to the museum as quickly as you like. Um, tell me about the doors that we can see on the right hand side of this image. Okay, so these are the original iron doors. They're 200 years old. The iron, um, incidentally, that was used in this, uh, in this building uh, was imported from the Butterley foundry in Derbyshire. So they came from England. Right. So these doors are the originals. I don't know if you can make out the lock, the lock and the key there. Um, but of course, they were used to secure the building. Uh, so that the contents will be safe. You have a stunning vault called... The Influence Gallery. So on screen now, people can see a number of people are featured here. And there are lots of familiar faces in this room of Irish people or people of Irish heritage who have done something abroad. But tell me about this gentleman. 
So on your screen, you can see Peter Rice, and here in his hand, he has the plans for the Sydney Opera House, which he worked on. He also worked on the Pompidou Centre in Paris, and he designed a system to hold together the glass window, which is at the front of this building. It was, this is called a cable stage system. You showed so, this picture yesterday, didn't you? It, it's, it's basically, we're using the same brackets that you can see uh, Peter hanging from here. That's right. He was widely known as the James Joyce of structural engineering, but he was more than an engineering genius. He had other interests, including poetry, philosophy, sports, France, wildflowers, wine. And um, here's a quote from a friend of his. He's the artist, Frank Stella. And this is what Frank Stella said about Peter. I guess it's obvious that Peter is a national treasure. Just to be around him makes you want to think and think as hard as you can. As we continue through the museum, every vault is different and every vault has a different look. But this is possibly the most photographed vault in that building. It's absolutely fabulous. This represents this, if you can see the lights and so forth, this represents the synapses of the brain. Right. And here in this uh, gallery, we feature many people of science, inventors, engineers, and so forth. In fact, uh, we talk about John Philip Holland. Mm -hmm. He's featured there too. You can see the picture. Um, he designed the first submarine for the American US Navy. I have a love of this vault. For its architectural links. Some people might know that there's a big link between architecture and criminals. But Mrs. O'Leary, tell Miss me about Mrs. O'Leary and her cow. Per Mrs. O'Leary. Well, Mrs. O'Leary was accused of, or shall we say, her cow was accused of kicking over the lantern that started the Great Fire of Chicago in the 1800s. Many people died, 300 people died, thousands left homeless. A lot of Chicago devastated buildings flattened and so on. So this was the perfect. Um, by canvas, if you like, for architects and engineers to, to start their work and begin this challenge. Um, but of course, Mrs. O'Leary was actually the world's right. first victim of fake news. That's, that's right. Innocent. A newspaper reporter admitted to fabricating the story, and she was persecuted her whole life after that. As you can see there in that uh, shot, the reporters are chasing her. Um, she was cleared 100 years after her death. But it is thanks to that fire and Mrs. O'Leary that we have this bridge outside the building. Tell me a bit about this. Okay, this is a set of uh, rolling bridges, as they were called. And it was William Scherzer of Chicago who designed these initially. They were such a they were they were such a success that he was able to patent them. So Sir John Purser Griffith of Dublin here, mm -hmm. Dublin Scotland's here. Um, decided to bring them in, and they were designed. We have two sets of them: one outside the building here, and another set of them at Samuel Beckett Bridge. We pay homage to lots of designers, to lots of artists and architects, uh, very famous people around the world. But can you tell me a little bit more about the link between George Washington and the letter that we see on screen, and Leinster House? Aha. Uh -huh. So this letter is a letter of, of congratulations to James Holborn because he had won the prestigious prize to become the architect of the White House. James Holborn was born in Kilkenny in 1758. Now he was the architect of the White House in, in Washington, DC, having won the competition for the best design. He is said to have modeled the design on Leinster House, which we know, of course, as the Doyle. The build did not last long because 12 years later, the British attacked, attacked the building and only the, shell of, only the shell of the building remained. So Holborn set about restoring it and completed the restoration in 1817. Holborn became superintendent of all Washington's public works, including the construction of the US Capitol building. In 1981, the James Holborn commemoration stamp was issued both in Ireland and in the USA, as a single 18p stamp and as an 18 cent and 20 cent stamp, respectively. Throughout the building, the designers really made a great use of the space. And one of my favorite rooms in the building is our library. Okay, welcome to our Whispering Library. Now, as you can see from the bookshelves, there are a number of colored books which you can pull out 
and they will talk to you. Hence the name, the Whispering Library. And once they're pulled out, slightly from position, you can hear recorded text taken from Ulysses, Gulliver's Travels, Gone with the Wind, Country Girls, and Dracula. Dracula, of course, was written by Bram Stoker. Another architectural reference is within the pages of some of Stoker's uh, books, you can read the descriptions of England's Gothic architecture in the 19th century. Uh, there's a place called 138 Piccadilly, and this is a listed grade two building. And scholars of Bram Stoker's work actually have identified it as one of Draco's houses. Most of the buildings described in Stoker's work were destroyed in the London Blitz. Uh, we also pay homage to the Tourism Ireland Global Greening, which is a celebration of St. Patrick's Day across the world. So hence we have many, not just the ones on our screen, but many iconic buildings globally, which are greened on, to honour St. Patrick, St. Patrick. And also in our vaults, we have a new uh, exhibition, which is called Power of the Name. Okay, so this is an exhibition where people can record the names of their family members who have emigrated and thus uh, honour them in a certain way. When you come out of Epic after going through those 20 galleries that we talked about, you see this image and above. Every person is connected. So that's the EP. I see for Epic. So we've talked about your love of the building and your love of the glass facade, but what's your favourite architectural part of Epic? I love the building. I love the design of the building, I love the feel of the building, I love the space of the building, and I love the light of the building, especially when you come in here early summer mornings, you can see the sunshine flooding through, and throughout the seasons in the autumn. Lovely in all the seasons. I love the light. You love the light. I love the light over the staircase. Yeah, okay. I think it's beautiful. I think the symbol, it's, it's rich, it's poetic, and it means something solid, something real. It's not only how beautiful it looks, it's copper coloured and candle shaped, and, but that's also the symbolism behind it. Also, I love, I have seen it in the dark and I love how it glows. You can see it from the distance, the other side of the river, and I love the glow, but and the whole symbolic and the imagery of it. My favorite reaction is, I wasn't expecting that, about the design of the building. That's your favorite reaction? Yeah. yeah. What's yours? I know when I hear somebody, and I've heard it say a few times, wow, an exclamation of wow. And, I, and then the cameras, being picked out. There you are already. You have that already in the first gallery in Open Island. So that sets the scene um, for the rest of the 20 galleries. And as we've spoken about, each gallery is different. So you, you enjoy your work here, Susan. I love it. I love interacting with people. And it doesn't matter who they are, where they're from, what age. We do school tours. We do uh, men's sheds tours. We do uh, all kinds of tours. Tours for the tourists. American groups, French groups, German groups. Uh, we have a lot of our team that speak different languages as well. So uh, yes, we, we all, I think we all enjoy our work. But yeah, it's great. It's great to have the interaction. It benefits uh, not only myself, but our visitors, if it's a two-way street. We're going to leave it there. Susan, thank you very much for your time for this tour of Epic. People can go to the website and go to epicchq.com and do a virtual tour where you can click from gallery to gallery and have a look around yourself. Thank you very much to Open House Dublin, to Dot Patch Labs, to Damien for doing the filming today, and thank you for watching. If you have any questions, you can contact us through the website at epicchq.com.